Good afternoon and welcome to the Baylor Conversation Series. I'm President Linda Livingstone and we greatly appreciate you spending time with me and our distinguished panel this afternoon to discuss a very important issue. Last fall at Baylor, we began a focus on civil discourse as part of an ongoing conversation series that we host. Those conversations on civil discourse provide an important foundation for the discussion we're going to have today on race and social injustice, an issue that our country, our communities, and our universities are grappling with from coast to coast. I'm really pleased to have with me today some of our distinguished faculty who are really experts on issues of race and injustice. So please join me in welcoming first, Dr. Mia Moody Ramirez, Chair of the Department of Journalism, Public Relations and New Media, a former journalist and noted author on race. Welcome, Dr. Moody Ramirez. Hi. Dr. Greg Garrett, professor in the Department of English, but as, um, as you will find out, his expertise reaches entertainment, pop culture, and race. And also Mr. Malcolm Foley, a former student regent, doctoral candidate in religion, a director of discipleship at Mosaic Church Waco, and new senior advisor to the president, to me, on equity and campus engagement, and on a personal note, a very soon to be first time father. So welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin the conversation today, which is one that I have really looked forward to over the last few weeks as we've been planning it, I want to take a few minutes to uh, re-emphasize a couple of points that I think are important. First, at Baylor, we value our faculty, staff, students and friends of color. Black lives absolutely matter at Baylor. And as a Christian institution of higher education, we should step into these significant current events and build upon our actions to date while also elevating the difficult and uncomfortable but very important conversations that we need to have around these issues. So we have a lot to discuss today, so let's move on to our conversation. Uh, there will be an opportunity at the end of my conversation with our guest to take some questions for the audience. So please uh, put those into the chat function and we will address some of those at the end. Now, all of our panelists come from very different academic backgrounds and experiences. So I wanna start by getting each of them to share their perspective on the horrific deaths that have been suffered recently by several black citizens in our country and how our society has responded uh, so far. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Moody Ramirez and would love for you to share your perspective on this. Yes, so we have seen recently that social media platforms are very powerful. Hashtag activism and various social media platforms have been used by marginalized groups as, as tools to disseminate messages. A few of the social movements that have been propelled into the public eye are hashtag Me Too, Bring Back Our Daughters, and the Black Lives Matter movement and Arab Spring. These popular movements illustrate that citizens can mobilize and unite on social media platforms very easily and share information about racism and other injustices. In many cases, change involves protest, protesting, as we have seen historically and recently. Using social media, everyday citizens can mobilize and organize large groups for protest, whether they are peaceful or violent. In Waco, for example, several teenagers recently used Snapchat to organize a peaceful demonstration for George Floyd in just one night. It was very successful. My family and I had the honor of attending the peaceful demonstration. I believe and hope that social media platforms will continue to be instrumental and fueling protest because of the rapid and inexpensive exchange of information. Social media platforms help level the playing field for younger generations and marginalized groups who want to share messages on online. Does that answer your question? That's very helpful. Appreciate that perspective, particularly given your expertise in, in social media areas. Uh, Dr. Garrett, what, what are your reflections on what you're seeing happen in society right now? 
Okay, um, well, President Livingston, in my work in the English department and at our Truett Seminary, I wear several different hats, um, uh, novelist, critic, theologian, but all of those revolve around story. Uh, story is how we understand our lives, it's how we communicate to other people, and it's how we make meaning. And a really powerful and profound story um, hits us in our essential humanity. It shakes us and it moves us. And when we see stories like the story of George Floyd, um, a brother, a fellow child of God who died in fear and anguish, um, we look at that and as fellow human beings, we look at that story and we can't help but be moved by it. But speaking particularly on behalf of my white brothers and sisters, we also can't help but notice how our story differs from his story. There is no American story where Greg Garrett dies with someone's knee on his neck. And one of the heart-wrenching things that we are recognizing in this moment um, is the difference between white stories and the stories of people of color and the very powerful um, awareness and recognition. And recognition is probably a word I'm gonna use a lot today because it feels to me like we're in this tipping point, pivotal moment mm -hmm. where people are understanding from the stories that they're experiencing that this is not right, that it is unjust and that something needs to change. Now, thank you for sharing that. And those individual stories are powerful and they're really something people can relate to more even than research or other things that we might be able to share on these issues. So you're absolutely right. Soon to be Dr. Foley, what uh, are your reflections on what's happening in society today? And particularly as you prepare to bring a new child into this world, it's an important thing for you to be able to do. No, it's true. Um, and, and, and when I look at particularly what's been going on recently, I, I, so, my, so my research is specifically on, on lynching. Uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And, and, and when I think of particularly uh, a, few of these, a few of these past events that we've, that we've witnessed, I see kind of elements of particularly the history of lynching in each of these episodes. Um, and so I, I, call, I call what happened to Ahmaud Arbery a lynching. I call what happened to George, to George Floyd a lynching. Uh, when, I, when, I, when we think of Ahmaud Arbery's case, it exemplifies the fact that uh, there are citizens that have the confidence to be able to to be able to kind of sn to snuff out a black man's life and to think that there will be no consequences. In the case of in the case of Amy Cooper in Central Park, we have kind of the what 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 one could call kind of the weaponizing of of, of white of white womanhood. Um, in the case of in the case of George Floyd, we're, we we see the the prolonged and torturous death of a human being. Kind of just broadcast on social media, and I know that uh, I know that many when they when they watch that video, I I have not watched it, nor do I intend to, just for mental health purposes. Um, but many had never seen a public execution before, uh, much much less a nine minute long one. Um, but 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 those moments of kind of seeing the impunity uh, with which with which the police officers acted, and not just not just uh, Chauvin, who had it, who, who who had his knee on Floyd's on Floyd's neck, but even the officers around him, like that that was that was a shock. I'm sure that was a shock for a number of people. Um, and so and so it's a, it's an, it's encouraging, yes, that 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 a lot of people saw it, that they that they acted. Um, that's that's encouraging. But there also has to be the recognition that many, particularly black black people, have known have known that these are issues um, and have been fighting for. For a while, but it, it, it is it, it is good that people are getting on board. Um, but the question is, do we all have the stamina for what is a what what is a long haul a long haul battle? So that's where I, that's where I'm at, kind of initially. No, oh, really important thoughts, and and we do know people experience fatigue as they work on these really hard issues over long periods of time, and you know. The scripture talks about don't get, do become weary in doing good is an important one, I think, to put before us at a time like this. So, Dr. Moody Ramirez, you recently wrote a book uh, entitled mm -hmm. From Black Face to Black Twitter. And you've touched yes. on this a little bit, but I mm -hmm. would be interested in, hear more, in hearing more of your thoughts about how social media has fueled the protests and calls for justice that we're experiencing mm -hmm. today. And maybe even how you think that might go moving ahead, even from these early days of, of these reactions. Well, um, 
Black Twitter has been very instrumental. Um, black people have been able to mobilize in particular uh, using that platform because as a group, uh, they're able to share specific messages. Uh, and so when I, in my research, I've been able to look at specific memes that are shared on Twitter uh, by black people. And for people who don't know what black Twitter is, it is a part of the regular Twitter. <laughs> when I first started researching black Twitter, people said, well, how do you get to black Twitter? It's a, it's a part of black Twitter, but you actually are able to focus in on certain topics and, cer and certain issues by using hashtags. So what I, what I mentioned earlier, you can uh, pick out specific issues, like for example, Black Lives Matter. You can focus on police brutality by using the hashtag, I can't breathe, or hands up, don't shoot, or Black Lives Matter. You can focus in on that by using those hashtags. And so uh, African Americans have been able to mobilize and come together using those hashtags and focus specifically on police brutality. So Black Twitter has been very instrumental in fighting this battle. Uh, and I would say that we would not have been able to do this uh, 15, 10 or 15 years ago without Black Twitter. We would not have been able to mobilize as easily, uh, just passing out flyers or relying on the newspaper or relying on broadcast media. So social media has been very helpful. As you know, there were protests all over the United States uh, regarding George Floyd. Uh, so social media has been very helpful in this fight. Mm, absolutely. Well, Dr. Garrett, you study a little bit different aspect of the media than uh, Dr. Moody Ramirez does and look a lot at pop culture and have a new book entitled A Long, Long Way, Hollywood's Unfinished Journey from Racism to Reconciliation. What are you seeing from a larger cultural, larger cultural standpoint and why was now the time in today's culture for people to rise up for the oppressed and to let their voices begin to be heard more significantly than maybe they have in recent years? Yeah, that is, that is such a great question. And, and I think what I would do is I would say not just the oppressed, but also the oppressor, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that um, people who have long participated in this system without acknowledging the privilege that they get from it are now recognizing what people of color go through on a, an everyday basis. Um, so I'd like to start with where Dr. Moody Ramirez started us with social media and then sort of walk across a couple of different cultural markers. Um, I used the, the phrase tipping point a while ago and I, I hope and pray that it is. Um, but in, in my own life, um, as a writer and a scholar, I'm on social media a lot. And uh, about a week ago, I posted something on Facebook um, about an experience that I had with a black father from my daughter's elementary school. And he came to my mostly white upper middle class neighborhood in Austin. And um, he was there to pick up the class t-shirt uh, for his son who was in the truck with him. And uh, it was like 30 seconds into our interaction when I realized that everything that he was saying to me and everything about his posture was intended to communicate to me that he was not a threat, that he belonged there. And, and my heart broke because I, I realized exactly what was going on. And one of the things that my spiritual director is always telling me is we learn over and over again the things that we need to know. And so I was reminded again, this is not something I would ever have to think about. But um, I, I posted this story on Facebook. And uh, just to, to give you sort of a measuring point, um, you know, an average post for me might have 100 likes and five shares. Uh, this post was liked 50,000 times and closing in on 70,000 shares across the country. And as I look at the comments, and I'm trying very hard to stay on top of this and to interact with as many of them as I can, but what I'm discovering is that there are uh, some people of color who are saying, thank you for pointing out what we have to go through every day, which is a very real acknowledgement. But the vast majority of them are from white people who let me know that I have never thought about this before. This has opened my eyes. And I, I think we are in this opening eyes moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a couple of other cultural markers, uh, moving on from social media. The two best-selling books in America right now are about race. Uh, <clears throat> is White Fragility, 
uh, which is uh, a book about how to talk to white people about race because white people don't like to talk about race, which I know very well from the four years that I spent talking with white people about race. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other one is Ibram Kendi's great book about the history of racism in America. Uh, it is a very rare thing for two books on such a difficult topic uh, to be the most read in America. And then as we look at a couple of other markers, uh, Gone with the Wind being taken off of HBO until it can be put back in some kind of context, uh, NASCAR and NFL making decisions related to um, their understanding of race and prejudice and, and sort of dangerous symbols. It, it does really feel to me like we are in this movement uh, and in a moment. And so as a cultural theologian, the question I always ask is why this and why now? You know, why, why are people responding in this way at this moment? And, and the crazy thing about it is that for all of us who have wanted to write off 22, 2020, it feels to me like the strange sort of set of circumstances that we've had uh, the coronavirus and the quarantine, the economic uncertainty, um, the uh, fear and the loss of control that all of us have experienced mm -hmm. have, I think, tapped into a possible empathy and time for reflection. And, you know, there are only so many episodes of whatever that you can stream. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to sit with the world and with yourself and, and I believe that, you know, unlike 2016 or 2012 or 1968, we are in this moment where because of these strange and weird things that have happened, we are actually in a place where particularly white people cannot hide from what is happening in the culture. And I think that accounts for uh, all the white people joining people of color on the barricades and, and these sort of cultural shifts and changes. And, you know, I, I hope and pray that, you know, as Dr. Moody Ramirez was saying like that we can we can sustain this movement um, going forward because it does really feel to me like we are in this pivotal time culturally where something could be different. It is an unbelievably unique confluence of events that we're dealing with right now. And I think if you look back in history, oftentimes the most some of the most difficult moments in history some of the best things come out of those very difficult moments because we tend to be much more self-reflective. We sometimes draw more on our faith at those times. So I think those are unbelievably important points. And hopefully we can take advantage of this moment and really make it one that makes a difference for the long run. You know, we've been talking about this uh, conversation for quite some time and really thinking about, you know, the role of the church and our responsibility as Christians when it comes to race and peacemaking and conciliation. Uh, of course, fueled by repentance in that process. So uh, my questions for Mr. Foley, um, as Christians, what should our response be when we experience injustice as we've seen in our country, or we see others experience injustice? And ultimately, what is our responsibility as God's children at a time like this? Yeah, so the, uh, the, great, the great Angela Davis uh, said that in a in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. And in the in the post-civil rights movement, uh, racist has kind of, has kind of become an epithet, and so so hackles hackles get raised whenever someone's thoughts, words, or deeds are deemed uh, are deemed racist. And so and so when we think about that responsibility, that responsibility lies on us who experience racial injustice and 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 we who 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 perpetuate and and justify such injustice. And so our response ought to be first, first and foremost, uh, self self interrogation is a huge is a huge part of it. Um, and, and not only of our of our ideas, but also of our complicity in what in what can be in what are death dealing and humanity degrading policies. And so the narrative of anti racism ought to be self evident to the to the to the Christian. Of course, we do harm to one another because of our self interest. Of course, when those practices of oppression and misuse of power become public, of course we're gonna we're we're going to construct narratives in order to make ourselves feel better. I mean, categories categories of race were particularly created in order to offer people that kind of that kind of comfort. Um, and this isn't just a black white binary thing. R or, or racialization is used to marginalize our Latino and Latina brothers and sisters and our Asian brothers and sisters. And this is something that we're seeing, especially kind of the heat turned up because of the coronavirus. 
And, mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so our responsibility as Christians then is not, not to be comfortable and it's also not to oppress. Uh, we've, been, we've been told the category in which to place every human being, and that's the image of God category. Uh, I like the, uh, the Dutch Reformed uh, Herman, Herman, Herman Bovink, his, his construction that, that, that the essence of human nature is it's being created in the image of God. And so the image of God is not something that you bear or something that you have, it's something that you are. And so when, we're, so when we treat, so, so, so that's then the basis of how we, of how we ought to be treating one another. Um, and so, and so that's, I mean, you know, there's, there's some more extended reflection you can do on that, but it applies to, it applies to racial issues in this way. We've been given two commandments to love the Lord, our God with all our heart, soul, 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 and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it's imperative that we do both of those wisely, constantly, and consistently. And so that means that when we're in a society that, that, that marginalizes racial minorities precisely, precisely in order to maintain made up categories of inferiority and superiority, the Christian ought to not only have no part in that work, but, 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 but we actually ought to seek that those structures and policies actually be dismantled because we care, because we, because we care about our, our neighbor and seek, and seek their life. I think, um, I think particularly um, of, of kind of the reformed confessional tradition in, in, and in thinking through the 10 commandments, you're not just, you're not just saying don't murder, but, but paired with that are duties. And one of the duties uh, and, 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 and the duties that are kind of associated with, especially the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, is that we're actively setting ourselves against anything that tends toward the unjust taking away of the life of any. And so, and so, so basically what that means is that not only do I not wish to kill you, but I'm actually, but, but, but I'm actually seeking ways to support your life. That's how I'm actually obedient to the mm -hmm. commandment. That's how I'm actually living out kind of the love, the love that Christ has, uh, the love that Christ has told me to live, to live out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's how it works. That's how it works. I think at the, at, at the, uh, in thinking at, in, in thinking of the individual Christian, I know a little later on, we'll probably talk about kind of the church institution right. when, we, when we think about, when we think about the Christian, those are the categories that I use. Uh, doctors Moody Ramirez or Garrett, would you like to add any additional thoughts to what Mr. Foley has shared? Yeah, I would like to add something. I, I agree with Mr. Foley. Uh, as we look at the life of Jesus, it's clear that as Christians, we are called to seek justice and to correct oppression. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 1 and 17 states, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression. And as Christians, we must ask, what does it mean to seek justice? And I believe that it starts with prayer. Uh, we must seek wisdom from God who will provide the answers if we're willing to listen. Uh, and I also think that it begins with the person in the mirror. We can't change other people, but we can change ourselves. And uh, Doc, uh, President Livingstone, you are correct. People look to Baylor for answers. Uh, we must serve as examples for our brothers and sisters. Um, and as Christians, we can't be afraid to speak up for what is right. And it is important for us to evaluate how we treat people here at Baylor. And I know it is a process, uh, but it is also uh, time for us to look at our, our faculty and staff and to make sure uh, that I know that we're doing well as far as um, recruiting um, diversity in students. And I know that we're also working on um, diversity and retention and faculty, uh, but we just need to make sure that we're continuing those efforts. Uh, so, but I think it begins with us. Uh, as I said, we can't control what other people do, but we can control what we do here at Baylor. And people are looking at us. They are watching what we do. They always like to point the finger at what we're doing. Uh, so we just need to make sure that we're doing our best. And no one is perfect. Uh, but we can always try to do better. Now, I appreciate that reminder of the responsibility we have as yes. individuals at a university and as a university to really be a model for living this out mm -hmm. uh, as flawed as we all are at times. So I appreciate yeah. that. And it's really reminder. hard. It's a struggle. And I know at Baylor where we are, we're doing, I think we are doing some really positive things, uh, but it's a continual battle. 
Um, and there's always that. more to do. It, yeah, there's always more to do. Always more we can do and will do. Mm -hmm. Dr. Garrett, your thoughts? Well, I, I've got two things. First, I want to second what my colleagues have said about self-interrogation. And uh, again, I'm speaking particularly to my white brothers and sisters. Uh, one of the public programs uh, that I've done over the last couple of years where we've screened films and done um, conversation was at the historic Trinity Wall Street in Lower Manhattan. And uh, one of our speakers at that event was Dr. Catherine Meeks, who runs the Absalom Jones uh, Center for Racial Reconciliation for the Episcopal Church. And she retold the gospel story about Jesus and um, the sufferer at the side of the Pool of Siloam. And uh, those of you that know the story know that there was a miracle that happened with some regularity, but there was this individual who had been by the pool for years and years and years. And Jesus's question cut directly to the bone. And it was the question that Catherine Meeks asked this room full of people that had gathered together to talk about racial justice and healing. The question that Jesus asks is, do you want to be healed? Mm -hmm. And what Dr. Meeks said is, if you don't want to be healed, then all of this conversation is for naught. You know, if, if you are content to go on in a world where this injustice exists and you can turn a blind eye to it, then nothing that I have to say is going to matter. And so that's, that's the question that has been at the heart of my research over the last four years. Do we want to be healed? I think that we do. I think that is at the heart of our faith. Yes. And, and the second thing that I would do is I, I would uh, talk about Dr. King's uh, speech in Memphis the night before he died. Mm -hmm. And he often preached on the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he told the story about uh, the two religious leaders who passed by the man who had been beaten and left for dead beside the road. And there are all these sort of exegetical moves that preachers make about this. You know, they were on their way to temple and they couldn't touch him because they wouldn't be able to, to perform their ritual functions. But Dr. King cut to the bone as well. And he said, you know, really the truth is they were afraid. Mm -hmm. They were afraid that if they stopped to help this person, that something terrible would happen to them. And so what Dr. King talked about that night was that it is, it is the role of every person of faith to practice dangerous unselfishness. And I think that that is what we are called to live into, into these hard and uncomfortable conversations that we will have to have about how we got here and how we get out of it, and about how white people begin to let go of some of the power and the benefits in this system that maybe we didn't create, but that we benefit from daily. And so I, I think those two calls, you know, the calls to healing and the calls to dangerous unselfishness are really at the heart of, of our faith and, and what we are being asked to do. No, I appreciate those mm -hmm. thoughts. And some of those thoughts make me think back to just the, the, the core role repentance plays early in a process like this to acknowledge um, the flaws in our own lives and in our institutions and then to be able to move forward from that to begin that healing process. So I appreciate you all uh, sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to encourage our audience if you have questions you'd like to ask our panel to put those uh, in, the, in the question and answer function and then we will certainly get to some of those uh, towards the end of our conversation. In my inauguration address, I talked about how the world needs a Baylor. And in times like these, uh, you know, I think this statement probably rings even truer now than it did then. And as an institution of higher education, particularly a Christian research institution, and frankly, a institution that has a history in this area that is not always a pleasant history to talk about. What should our role be as we think about uh, how we can influence and help make a difference in addressing these issues of race and injustice. Uh, Dr. Garrett, you might want to kick us off on this. Yes, Well, because I, I think I've already kind of addressed that, oh, so I'm gonna have to regroup. <laughs> so we'll let Dr. Garrett start. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll have a, a follow-up. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Okay. I, I think, of what President George W. Bush said at the dedication of the National Museum of the African American um, History and Culture Museum at the Smithsonian 
a couple of years ago. And he said, a great nation doesn't hide its history, it faces its flaws and corrects them. And, and I think that what we are called to do at Baylor is to have honest, loving, difficult and rigorous conversations about how to face those flaws and correct them. And that, that's something that happens in classrooms and in my discipline, I'm lucky, you know, I, over the course of a year, I get to talk about Huck Finn and I get to talk about African-American theology and I get to talk about Jordan Peele's Get Out. And, you know, if you're in math, maybe you don't have those options. Um, but I think in classrooms and outside of classrooms in events like this, and in events like uh, the one that we sponsor at the National Cathedral, the, the National Film Festival, a long, long way. Um, and in the work that the Baylor and Washington program is doing to kind of um, orient uh, people to understanding what kind of Christian voice Baylor might have in this. Um, I, I think that in terms of why the world needs a Baylor, because we can bring this call for compassion and justice and love of God and neighbor in a really powerful and profound way because we are doing it not just from our faith, but also from this understanding that we are playing at the top of our game as a university as well. I appreciate that. Mr. Foley, you said you had something you'd like to add yeah. to this. Thomas. Yeah, uh, I, think it's, I think it's helpful, especially in, um, in academic settings that, that we have an opportunity to be careful and consistent about our definition of terms. And so as uh, like as even even as and especially as as Christians, we ought to kind of call things call things what they are. If we're if we're going to, if we're going to confess, we ought to confess our particular sins particularly. Um, and so and so, for example, if I if I talk about if I talk about white supremacy and whiteness, like it's a, it's important that uh it's important that I that I define what I mean when I'm talking about those things. So uh, and and we have opportunities, especially as a university, to really to really dig it to really dig into dig into that. Um, and so you know, so when I so when I talk about whiteness, I'm re I'm referring to the 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 norming of white racial identity. So basically, in another way, it's just the way that particular cultural expressions get treated as though they're just normal. Or said it said another way, when 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 people who are racialized as white do things, that's then glossed as the way that things are done, as opposed to just kind of the way that we the way that we do things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and and when I think about white supremacy, I'm thinking about something that works hand in hand with that. It's the it's the thoughts, the words, and the deeds that then bolster the idea that racialized whiteness is is superior. Uh, and that and that other groups of people are inferior for whatever reason. And the academy, with its resources for historical inquiry, for sociological inquiry, for data collection, all those kinds of things, all those things can battle against what some scholars have called strategic ignorance, which is which is which is which is which is the fact that there are some things that people don't know because it's in their best interest not to know it. Um, you don't you you don't think about the downstream consequences of your actions so that you can continue to act in your own self-interest. Um, and, and, so, and so that's something that, that's, that's something that we have an opportunity to not only fight against for ourselves, but also we can seek to make it uncomfortable for others to be strategically ignorant as well. Um, if, we're to be, if we're to be a place that is seeking for, the, uh, for not only the advancement of, of human knowledge, but for us as a Christian university to do so to the glory of God and for the good of our neighbors, um, that the, it, it, any any kind of uh, any kind of entrenched ignorance is something that that ought, that ought to have that ought to have no place among us. Good, and I already shared uh, something about diversity and, and retention, but I also wanted to say that we need to acknowledge and lift up our Bailey, Baylor family, the people who are actually doing positive things. We have so many people in our Baylor family that are reaching out to others and that are doing positive things for the community. So we don't want it to look like we don't have people in our family that are doing positive things and, and that are loving. Uh, we also need to remember that we are not born hating one another. Uh, people learn to hate based on social cues, media messages, environment, and many other factors. Students who didn't learn to love thy neighbors at home can still learn while they're in college. 
So this is one of the things that we emphasize at Baylor. And as parents, that's why they send their children to college, to become better all around citizens. So no, no one is perfect, uh, but we as parents, that's why we send them to college, to become better citizens. And so that is at least that's my hope as a parent. That's why I hope my children can become better. And I have seen transformation in students, in faculty, in administration, and staff at Baylor. So I know that it can happen. So I do want to uh, leave, you know, I want to add that positive note. Um, and it is never too late to unlearn racism. And I think we could all share stories of transformation, of yes. transformational experiences we've seen colleagues yes. or students have in our academic environment. And it is truly what we're here to do. That's uh, what to we're here to do. Lives and to educate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's painful to go through that transformation process, but it's critical and important that we, we all do it ourselves and then we help those around us Others. to do that. And that's why people, some, that's why our parents send their, their children to Baylor. Yeah, no, I appreciate that perspective. Now, I expect that Mr. Foley's gonna really want to answer this next question, so I'm gonna give it to him first because it's really about the role of the church and his academic area of study is around the church and, and frankly, its role in, in lynchings as he shared a little bit earlier. So uh, if you look from a historical standpoint, the church has been complicit in racism and previously actually used evangelism as a means for justifying slavery. So uh, where are our churches now in the midst of recent events and what role should our churches be playing today in, in what's happening and moving us forward and making a difference? I'm gonna so, start with Malcolm there. Yeah, so, so, so glad you asked that question, Madam President. Um, and it's a, it's, a long, it's a long and sordid history. <laughs> um, the scriptures and theology have been extensively used, used to to oppress. I mean, essentially every Southern, every Southern denomination is so because of its active support of, of American chattel slavery. And, and the, and the so-called curse of Ham and Mark of Cain were, were biblical narratives that, that a number of white folks mo mobilized in order to affirm their own dominance. But, um, but the church must also be aware of the fact that abusus non tolet usum, which means ab abuse does not does not cancel use. So the fact that these things have been misused to oppress doesn't mean that they can't be properly used. What it means is that we have to be very discerning when we do use them. Um, and so it means that, uh, for example, the historic black church is a historical and theological gold mine as the persecuted American church. Um, and so as, so as we think of as we think of the role of the church in the midst of recent events, we ought to be a beacon of the good news of Jesus Christ. Like that's that's always that's always the mandate. Um, and here's how. It means that we ought to be the first to repent and repair. It means that it means that there ought not be kind of there 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 ought there ought not be kind of significant Christian cover-ups of of sin or misconduct. I mean, we've we we've seen that with issues of racial racial injustice. We've seen it with issues of sexual abuse in the church and things like that. And and we, and we have to be clear that there's that that there's no place for that, because we have to be a beacon of the world that. We recognize our own sinfulness and that we're willing to, to, to erect structures, not to hide that sinfulness, but to root it, but to root it out. Because otherwise, kind of those, those impulses, those natural human impulses to protect and to control, uh, which often just get kind of writ large uh, in institutional um, context, those things will win out if we're not, if we're not kind of constantly in this, in this habit of recognizing, hey, we're, we're vulnerable. Um, and so that so so that also means that the that the Christians in the in the pews need to be e equipped for the work of ministry. It's important that the scriptures don't frame the elders as the only ministers. Every Christian is in is in is in ministry, and so and so leaders have to be doing the work of equipping their congregations with biblical tools to root out racism and white supremacy, not only in their own minds and in their families and in their workplaces, but also in local, state, and national contexts as well. Um, and some have been doing that, others have been more reticent. Um, but if we're facing systems that tend toward the unjust taking away of the life of any, um, then we're to set ourselves against those things in the name, in the name of Jesus, as, a, as, as an example. Um, in ancient Greco-Roman culture, exposure of unwanted or physically deformed children, infants was not, was not uncommon. Um, but the early church did not just condemn that practice. They actively took in those infants and cared for them. 
And so this is, it's one of the reasons why, why, why churches become the established site for abandoning infants. It's because it's it's because it's not it's not merely enough for us to establish kind of what we're against. We have to be for we have to be for something, um, and as the church, that means that we must be for the good news of Jesus Christ that he came to sin that he came to save sinners and that his care is holistic, not just spiritual. And so that ought to put us that ought to put us on the front lines of thinking through what does it mean for me to love to love my neighbor wisely, wisely and well. No, thank you. Those are really powerful thoughts. Yeah. Dr. Moody Ramirez, what are your thoughts on the role the church should be playing today? I, I think that uh, members of congregations are certainly expecting their uh, ministers to take a stance on, on the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, they want them to um, speak up, speak out, at least tell them what they think, um, because many of them look to their uh, pastors for advice uh, and so if they're if they're not telling them anything about the subject then they're going to be at a loss uh, and of course now many of us are watching our church uh, online or virtual on a virtual church uh, and my pastor actually mentioned something about it and that made me feel better about uh, the, the movement to, to hear him speak out about it uh, so I definitely think they need to uh, say something about it and, and offer words of encouragement uh, so that people can say, okay, this is, this is how my pastor feels about it. He feels strongly that as black people, if you're a member of a black church, then certainly you're going to want to hear something about it. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that uh, churches need to take a stand um, and they, I would think that they would want to be supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement. I appreciate that. Dr. Garrett, other thoughts you have? Well, I would second what you and Mr. Foley said about repentance. Mm -hmm. um, I was speaking about that um, post on Facebook that went viral last mm -hmm. week. And I had a, an interchange with someone who said, you know, I would take you a whole lot more seriously if you weren't a Christian. Uh, because the church has absolutely nothing to say about justice. Uh, all the church is concerned about is, you know, someone's, you know, salvation, someone's, you know, personal relationship with Jesus. And I said, you know, that, that may be true with some of our Christian brothers and sisters, but I see that changing. And that certainly is not my understanding of how the church speaks into this dialogue. Um, I was raised, you know, traditionally conservative Southern Baptist, where our salvation was the focus of things. And then Later in my life, I was rescued by a historically African-American Episcopal Church in East Austin, Texas. And for them, it was about saving us for this life and the next. Mm -hmm. and, and what it puts me in mind of is what Dr. King used to say about how if churches didn't speak into the lives of the people that they were um, trying to minister to, if they didn't speak into injustice and to deprivation, that they would become irrelevant social clubs. Mm -hmm. And I, I have this very powerful sense that, you know, as we talk about this pivot point here in history, this possibility for us, it does feel to me like many of our Christian brothers and sisters have looked at the story of George Floyd and many of these other folks who have, um, have suffered and died or, you know, been oppressed in some way or other and have said to themselves, we are absolutely lacking. We have fallen short of what we are called to do. We have fallen short of loving God and our neighbor. Mm -hmm. and, and I do really believe that there is this possibility now for repentance on the behalf, particularly of the white church, mm -hmm. and involvement in um, this, this movement. Um, because this is, this is the time for the Christian church to speak up and say, yes, we love, we care, we believe, that this is wrong and, and we cannot be silent when we see injustice. Yes, I agree. Yeah, no, it's very powerful and so true. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when we tackle difficult issues or sensitive topics, you know, I, I frequently say that we're on a journey to work our way through those difficult circumstances. And it certainly took us many years to get to the point that we're at on these issues of race and, and injustice. 
and it will probably unfortunately take us many more years to reach a stage of conciliation. But we've talked about this earlier. We are really in a unique moment in history where we have the opportunity to take a huge leap forward that could shorten that timeline significantly to get to true uh, conciliation. So what should our next steps be? Um, how might we think about what we should do as individuals and, and as communities to move forward? And I'll start with Dr. Moody Ramirez. Okay, as Dr. Garrett said, we have seen lots, we've seen tremendous change in the last few weeks. Uh, the next steps, in my opinion, would be to continue the trajectory. Uh, mm -hmm. We are witnessing an important time in history where we are finally acknowledging and weeding out some of the racist symbols in American culture. Uh, for example, many companies are considering rebranding their products. Uh, such as the Aunt Jemima pancakes, and I know that's been very controversial, but that's just one example. Uh, Confederate statues have been removed. Uh, the AP style book, which is the second Bible for my uh, discipline, we use that for journalism. Uh, it now capitalizes the letter B for black people, which that's a long time coming. Uh, streets have been named Black Lives Matter Avenue or Boulevard. Uh, in addition, after the brutal death of George Floyd, uh, Minneapolis dissolved its police department altogether. And so this is more progress than we've seen in a couple of weeks than we've seen in hundreds of years. Um, so we can only imagine what's on the horizon. As Christians, we have to take on the leadership role in race relations, and we really can't be afraid. Um, I think at Baylor, we have to continue to push uh, for change um, and continue. We, we see that that this what's going on now, um, we can kind of get on the bandwagon and, and keep pushing for change. Now is a good time um, to push for change and equality. Wonderful. Dr. Garrett. Well, to start off with, I want to second something that we've all said, I think, at one point mm -hmm. or another. Um, in a private conversation that I had with Dr. Catherine Meeks, she talked about how racial reconciliation and racial healing is a marathon, mm -hmm. not a sprint. <laughs> and um, white people particularly want it to be a sprint. It's mm -hmm. like, I have realized, oh, I had some racist ideas and thus racism is over. And, and so one of the things that I have to emphasize for people is that there are two things we're talking about, individual racism and systematic racism. And so we've, we've brought this up earlier, but it, it's one thing to recognize your own understanding that, um, you know, I, I have been racist in the ways that I have thought or, or, or believed. And it's something else to say, now I need to tackle this system. And that is going to be the thing that requires a whole lot of energy. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I would say, and I would say this especially to our white listeners today, that what we need to do is read, watch, listen, learn, and unlearn. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I've mentioned Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility, which is the number one book in America. And I have witnessed this over and over over the last four years. Um, there is a, a binary in American culture where people have come to believe that racists are bad people. They're the people who march in Charlottesville. They're neo-Nazis. They're people wearing Klan hoods. And so to, to wrestle with racism, is to accuse people of being bad in some way. And uh, what white fragility talks about is how it immediately sends white people into a place of defensiveness or anger or fear or of shutting down. Mm -hmm. And um, those, are, those are not in any way productive ways to deal with the problems that we face. And, and I guess the last thing that I would say is I had a conversation with my dear friend Kelly Brown Douglas, who's a an African-American theologian, um, the dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union uh, Theological Seminary in New York. And, and she has been one of my great guides. Uh, I think it is really important to be able to listen and to be able to learn in this process. And um, I was really confused about something because what she said to me is, I don't want you to be my ally. And we hear that word ally used a lot in terms of white, black relationships. And she said, I don't want you to be my ally, because what that suggests 
is that this is my problem and you are helping me with it. And what Kelly said is you created this system and you perpetuate this system. White racism, white supremacy is a white problem. Mm -hmm. And as hard as that is to hear, it is absolutely true. So what people of color don't need is white people to be allies. What they need is us on the front lines to take a look at this Frankenstein's monster that we created and that we continue to benefit from and to help put it down. And, and that is a hard, painful thing to wrestle with. But, you know, thank you, Kelly, for helping me understand that. Um, I don't want to be an ally. I want to be on the front lines. That's good. It's powerful. That's Mr. Good. Foley, what do you think we need to be doing next? Well, that's going to require me to double dip in both Martin Luther King and Malcolm <laughs> X. So uh, I want to start. I want to start with uh, start with Reverend Dr. King uh, when he was asked uh, whether or not, uh, basically how how you can legislate morality. What he what he said was morality can't be legislated but behavior can be regulated. It, it, it may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me. And I think that's pretty important too. That's good. And, 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 and peace, so peacemaking, peacemaking is hard work. It's hard and it's constant work. Uh, it means to me that, that, we, that we've got to work toward what, what, what political sociology professor Roman David in Hong Kong has defined as, as transitional justice, and you can you can read about this in a, uh, there's a, there's an article that uh, Anthony Bradley wrote titled uh, "Finally Healing the Wounds of Jim Crow," um, and it's why it's important that uh, when I when I mentioned repentance and, and repair before, the, the 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 repair is a very important part of that um, because once we recognize that wrong has been done, we've got to start doing the work of healing the wounds. And this this brings me to my favorite my favorite Malcolm X quote because he's. Somebody stops him in an uh, in an interview, and they ask him, uh, "Malcolm, has there has there been progress?" And he immediately stops this guy and says, "No, no, 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 because 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 if you put a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six, that's not progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound that that the that the blow made. And so a lot of this work, a lot of this work that we've been doing has been like recognizing the knife, maybe pulling the knife out, maybe, but." But the, but this next but this next step is 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 the active work of healing, and so and so what that's going to require it's going to it, it's going to require us to to re narrate our history truthfully and recognize the recognize and proclaim the ways in which that history has been sanitized. So for example, when we think about when we think about Confederate monuments around the nation, we have to remember that these that these were things that were erected not immediately after the Civil War. But particularly in times when Black people were agitating for civil rights, and particularly in communities where the looming presence of a stone monument would intimidate Black communities. Mm -hmm. And so that's the history that we need to know and be very clear about. There's great work on that, uh, The Southern Past by, by Fitzhugh Brundage. Great, great work. But healing also means that we're actively caring for the marginalized in our midst rather than kind of assuming that just a rising tide will lift all boats. Because if, if, if someone faces particular obstacles through no fault of their own, or receives particular benefits through no merit of their own, it's as, as racial boundaries and benefits are, then it does us no good to kind of assume that there's equal opportunity. Because to do so, and to act as though all those things are equal now, is to be strategically ignorant. Um, and so, so we've got to, so, 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 so it starts with, it starts with doing that, uh, with doing that kind of interrogation. And the hope is that it begins, you know, that it, that it happens at the local level, that it happens at, at every, at every level of our, of our society. Because, you know, if this just comes, if this just comes, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, kind of in the federal state local setup, if it just comes from on high, I mean, We've seen we've seen we've seen kind of developments like that like that before. When you look at the history of um, of of school of school desegregation and things like that, people will find people will find local ways to get a, to get around to get around stuff. Um, and so it's going to require it's it's going to require vigilance. Um, as as I said, kind of at the beginning, this is a this is a long haul. 
this is a long haul. So, so the hope is, uh, so the hope is that everybody's, everybody's loins are girded. So. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. In it for the long haul. Right. I, and on the most basic level, I think we just need to stop stereotyping and prejudging people. If we can just get to know people for themselves, I think that will help a lot. Uh, because going back to Dr. Garrett's story, uh, that was why the man he met felt intimidated, just because of how people have approached him previously. They've stereotyped him as a, a black man. Um, so if, if we can just get to know people as individuals and, and stop thinking that all cops or all police officers are uh, violent and all black people are criminals, all black professors or tokens. You know, those are some of the preconceived notions that people have. Uh, so that's what gets us into trouble a lot of the time. So those, it's just some, some of the basic things that we can do. So I appreciate what you said, uh, Mr. Foley. We just need to do some of those basic things as individuals. Yeah, absolutely. Now I have one final question and it's really, a, I think a simple question for you all because you read and watch a lot of things and then we're going to go to audience questions and you just need to be forewarned that my questions were actually easy compared to the ones you're going to get from oh, the audience. Yeah, <laughs> we prepared. liked your questions. Your questions were nice. <laughs> So um, I know we have folks that would really like to learn more and dig deeper on these issues that we've discussed today. And you've shared a few thoughts on some books that are out there, but if you could recommend one book or one movie that you think would be particularly useful or powerful uh, for people to pay attention to, what would you recommend? And so I'm going to go to our English professor first. He probably has a whole litany of them, but he only gets yes. to pick one. Yes. <laughs> All right. I He's own, already been recommending some. <laughs> I feel like I've got a whole stack here, but yeah. Okay, here it is. Uh, James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time. Uh, this is a book that I've often taught at Baylor. It has been a powerful experience for all sorts of students. Uh, because Baldwin is one of the greatest writers in American history, not just a great black writer, but a great American writer. Uh, he deals with important themes, um, but he also allows us to understand his own particular black life. And um, so in writing this book, which came out earlier this year, um, this, this book has been in my backpack for four years. Oh. And it's going right back in my backpack as soon as our webinar is over. Um, because he has been this reliable guide for me um, to faith and to politics and to race and to art and to culture. Um, I, I think that James Baldwin is and will continue to be one of the, the most important voices in America on a multitude of subjects, but for particularly for people who want to understand a little something uh, about race and racism in America. Good. Very good. good. And on Twitter, you can put the rest of that list that you have, you know. Okay. See how many I will do that. Three tweets of your list you get. So, Mr. Foley, what one book or movie might you recommend? Oh, oh, can, I do, can I do two? <sighs> okay. I'll give you two. I'll give you two. <laughs> so, so First, first, uh, Jamar Tisby's *The Color of Compromise*, just because I think it's a, it's a, it's an extremely well done historical overview of. So you of took her. one of mine. Okay. Oh, well, <laughs> that's, that's okay. okay. That's okay. That's okay. She can, no, she can talk about that. She can talk no, about that. No, no, no. You I'm talk sure about it's on that. Dr. Garrett's list too. I'm so. Gonna, yeah, you talk about that, and I'm going to talk about a movie. Okay. 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 That's fine. Um. So. <laughs> so yeah. So it's, <laughs> so it's a. It, like I said, it's a, it's a great account of, of the church's complicity and white supremacy and mobilization of it, things like that. But the other one is a really important one. It's called The Color of Law uh, by, Richard, by, uh, by Richard Rothstein. And, it's, and, and it's, it, 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 will, it will show you that, um, that, that particularly white supremacy and racism are at, you, you, you got it up there. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And it, it, because it, it focuses on, on housing. Um, and most people have the assumption that kind of segregation was by law in the South and then just kind of a whole bunch of individuals in the North. Um, but, it, but it plays out at the, at the local, state, and national level. Um, and, and if you're asking kind of why schools are seg segregated, it's because housing is segregated. And you can see specifically the ways, the ways that that plays out um, in ways that extend far beyond just 
uh, the kind of racial housing covenants that that individuals may have had with their with their uh, with their subdivisions. When you see right. that, when you start to see kind of the scope of this issue, um, then we yeah. can start thinking through thinking through ways forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I love that Dr. Moody Ramirez is doing the movie and not Dr. Garrett. He's like a movie film guy. So Dr. Moody well, Ramirez, what movie most of my books, I will do a movie. Another reason I'm doing a movie is because most of my books are specific to journalism and they may not be of general interest. Um, and plus, uh, I just watched a good movie a couple of nights ago. It's called When They See Us. And it's a Netflix original movie. Uh, have you heard of it? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Foley. Oh yeah. It's a oh yeah. Wonderful movie. Wept, wept uh, the whole thing. <laughs> oh my goodness! And my sons told me they watched it a, a couple of years ago. I didn't know that it came out. Uh, you know, I didn't know that it had been out for a while. Uh, but it's critically acclaimed, um, and it and it describes like it shows you how police officers view black boys and men. Um, and it it's a movie about five boys who were arrested and placed in prison for many years for raping. A uh, white woman. It was a crime that they didn't actually commit, mm -hmm. but eventually they were uh, they were acquitted. Um, and it, so, of course, it, it had a, a positive ending. Uh, if if you can have a positive ending to something like that, but I think it's a good it's a good movie just because it it, show, it provides context uh, to a lot of what we're seeing right now. What's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement? So, for anyone who's still confused about that it would be a good movie to watch. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm gonna to go to audience questions. I'm actually start with one about the Black Lives Matter movement since you uh, mentioned that, Dr. Okay. Moody Ramirez, and all three of you don't have to answer all of these questions, uh, but okay. uh, certainly you're all welcome to weigh in. So this one actually asks, how can we help Christians separate Black Lives Matters as a truth and not as an attack on white people or a political stance? I know a lot of people sort of struggled with that phrase for that reason. So uh, I'm glad for whoever would like to maybe weigh in on that first. I always tell people that all lives matter, but at this point in history, we are particularly concerned with black lives because black people are being attacked and particularly black men and boys, but it's not just black men and boys, it's also black women. They're, they are being killed by police officers for no other reason than the color of their skin. They are being pulled over, they're being racially profiled. Uh, so that's why we are concerned uh, about black people at this point in history. And we, yes, we do know that all lives matter, but that's why we have the Black Lives Matter movement right now. And it began in 2009 with the death of Trayvon Martin. He was a, a I think, 13 year old boy who was actually killed just going to the store to buy a bag of Skittles and some tea. And he was killed for no other reason for just being black. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what I usually tell people and people are offended, uh, but that's why we're concerned about black people right now. And I'm the mother of two sons, but one is 15, one is 17, one is driving right now. And I have to tell him before he goes out to, if you get pulled over, this is what you need to do. You need to be, mind your manners, be very cautious. And that's what I have to do as a black mother. And I shouldn't have to do that. So that's why we're concerned as black people right now. Yeah, and to I'll, uh, add, a, add a little bit on there. Some, I mean, some, some people are gonna be uneasy with like saying Black Lives Matter because you might think, oh no, that, that affiliates me with the movement. There are other stances mm -hmm. that, the, that the movement takes that I, that I don't wanna take. And I understand that. So if the issue is with the phrase Black Lives Matter, then, then inculcate in the people that you know uh, that, that Black Lives Matter is actually the minimum. Mm -hmm. That the idea is that uh, we want to say that Black Lives are precious, that they are sick, that, that, they're, that they're sacred in the eyes of God. If that's the, if that's the message that you're actually inculcating in, your, in, 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 the, in the communities in which you're in, then great. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that for centuries we live, we, we essentially live in a culture and in a nation that has denied that truth. And so the yeah. idea is, if you can find whatever you can find whatever words or resources you want to then to reaffirm the fact that we've been living in a culture of death for centuries, mm -hmm. and 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 there's a need for us to then there's a there's a need for us to then affirm the humanity that is like, we're not making it true, like it just is true. 
Um, and so, and so, um, and so that's, that's, that's part of, uh, I think, I, I, I think that's one of the things that, that we need to keep in, that we need to keep in mind here. If, 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 if the words make you uncomfortable, okay, then find, find other words to say the same, to say the same thing. Um, but, but, but it's a, but it's a thing that needs to be, that absolutely needs to be said. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a slogan. Yeah. To, to and, and people could, should be able to understand slogans. Right. We've had slogans throughout history. Right. <laughs> now that's that's very helpful context. Yeah. So the next question: uh, Black and white are inherently colorblind and polarized terms, but we know colorblindness is not the goal in in the conversation. When I see the four of you on the screen, I see four very different skin colors. How can we work on our use of language to recognize and view each other in a true and vivid diversity of color rather than in colorblind black and white? Let, let me jump in here if I could, President Livingston. Um, uh, our friends Chip and Joe Gaines were on a uh, broadcast with Emmanuel Acho uh, mm -hmm. this week, um, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And uh, okay. one of the Gaines kids actually asked this question about color blindness. Mm -hmm. and, it is one of the things that comes up in white fragility as one of the excuses. Mm -hmm. uh, I was raised to be colorblind. Mm -hmm. And you don't hear it from a person of color. <laughs> you only hear it from white people. Because as we were saying earlier, white people swim in this ocean of whiteness where they don't have to think about who they are. They don't have to acknowledge uh, the benefits that they gain from that experience. And so, the way that I like to think about it is I want to live in a world in which we can be colorblind, but we do not live in the world where that is possible right now. No. Um, because no. for, for me to say that I am colorblind is simply to say I am happy with the way things are <laughs> and I am not happy with the way things are. No, and we start hearing that more after uh, former President Barack Obama was elected, people started saying, oh, we have a black president now. We live in a colorblind society. But that was not the case. So, As if it no, would solve all our problems, right? Yes, yes, all of our problems have been solved. So I don't think we'll ever live in a colorblind society. That would be ideal, but yeah. I don't think it will ever happen. I mean, we spent, like I said, my thing is we, we spent four to 500 years building the, building the racialized society yes. that, that, we, that we're in right now. It's going gonna, it's gonna to probably take at least that long of sustained resistance for that to, to break it. Yes, um, that's a good point. So it's, it's, it's generation by generation work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the, that's the kind of, that's the, that's the kind of forward looking that, we, that we're, that we're going to have to operate with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people need labels. So that person is asking about labels. The U.S. Census reports, they don't use the black-white labels. They use ethnicity. So if that's what the, do you, do you have a sense for what, if that's what the person was asking? Are they asking more no. of that or are they asking more of skin tone? I think it's more around the skin tone. Okay, so I yeah, we don't. Hard for me to, I don't want to put some big words Yeah, I don't think now, we'll but. ever live in a colorblind society. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and I'll just 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 one just one last thing. Like I I want I want people to see. I like like I don't want people to be to be to be blind to my color because I want people to understand that because of that because of my color that also means that I actually have to navigate the world in a different way. And so that yes. means that when you interact with me, like I want you to be aware of that of that history mm -hmm. because that's actually how you then love me is by is by then being is, is by being willing to listen and being will, willing to understand okay how are our experiences different so that i can so that i can love you well um and so That's and so 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 the so the idea so and <laughs> so my dad's my dad is uh is colorblind he's like i don't want to be like i want to be able to see the like, i want to be able to see the beauty the kind of kind of kind of the full the full orb beauty of god of god's creation Yep. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that, is that, is that before the throne in Revelation, we will, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be speaking in different languages, we'll be looking <laughs> differently, and it'll be a sign that, that Christ has, that Christ has bound us all together. And that's a, and that's a, and that's a, and that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful image. Um, it's not a monochromatic image. Um, yep. And so, and so that's something, like I said, it's something that we, that we ought to be, that we ought to be celebrating. Um, it's difficult. Um, but it's something to celebrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next question. 
I heard two Christian podcasters whom I admire claiming that anger is not an appropriate response to current events. Uh, I would think anger is a perfectly legitimate response to the lynchings, lies, and injustices. What do you think? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> who wants to tackle that one first? The person who does research on lynchings, maybe? Well, there you go. <laughs> That's a good choice. Look, it's, it's just funny that somebody would ask an anger question after I've already uh, quoted, quoted, quoted my namesake. Um, I mean, one of the things that made Malcolm X so popular was because, like, he was very clear that, like, no, like, we should be angry. Like, these are horrible things that we've been subjected to. Um, and, and even, and even in looking at, um, the way that, the way that King did his, did, did his activism, uh, it wasn't devoid, it wasn't devoid of, 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 of anger. It was just, it was, it was explicitly non, nonviolent because the idea is that kind of violence is not, violence is not going to get us where we, or, 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 or where we need to go. And this is, and this is true. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're told this in the scriptures, we don't seek vengeance because vengeance is the Lord's. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not that we don't seek vengeance because like the things that we're suffering aren't bad. No, it's that God actually recognizes that even more deeply than we do. And so anything that we, so, 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 so anything that we, if we were to act in retaliation, that would actually be a, a, a less just and less comprehensive mm -hmm. act of, act of just, act of so-called justice. Um, and so, and so, and so then, so when, so when we, but, but when we think of like emotional responses to these, to these kinds of things, um, I mean, God's angry at evil. God's angry when his people are oppressed. God, I mean, God, God is, God, God is angry at the, at the, at the diminishing of his, of his image. When you're treating, when you're treating somebody who's, who, who's created in his image and, de and degrading them, that is something that makes the Lord upset. Um, and so, and so if we're to be, our goal is to kind of, uh, as, as Christians, we not only want to kind of believe rightly and act rightly, but we also want to feel, we also want to feel rightly. Yeah. And so ideally we're being shaped to, to love the things that God loves and to hate the things that he hates. And he hates the, dimi the, the diminishment of his, uh, of his people. Um, and so, yes, you know, be angry and do not sin. Yes, don't, don't, don't let the sun set on your anger, but injustice ought to, injustice ought to, ought to create that kind of, that kind of anger, but it's not an anger that paralyzes. Um, it's not an anger that causes you to lash out in retaliation. It's an anger that then you, that then we, that then we give to the Lord and that the Lord then guides us in using it to love and using it to love one another. Um, and so it's, 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 it's anger. It's anger. Yes. But it, but it, but it manifests itself not in hate, but in a, but in a kind of, but in, but in a fierce love. Yeah. And, and what I would want to say just on behalf of the white response to righteous anger. Um, I mean, and it is all, you know, sort of tied into this white fragility thing that we've talked about throughout our broadcast today. Um, but in my graduate seminar in the spring, we read uh, some like seminal African American theologians. We read uh, James Cone, sort of the the father of, of African American theo theology. We read Kelly Brown Douglas, and, and my students would often turn to me uh, in person at first, and then online, and say they seem to be really upset, and it it made them feel attacked. It made them feel uncomfortable, and and the conversation that we had to have around that is. Well, for 401 years in this country, this has been the experience of African Americans. And so this is the theology that's emerging out of this. And can you imagine that they are happy about the way things are going? Mm -hmm. No, of course not. And, and, and so one of the things that I think white people have to wrestle with and begin to accept as a part of this movement is that they're is a very real and righteous anger about the injustice in our system. And it's expressed politically and theologically and culturally, and it absolutely should be, because what has happened in this country for 401 years is wrong. Mm -hmm. I agree. 
So we're getting pretty close to the end of our time. So I've got two pretty practical questions here at the end. And I want to assure our audience, we're going to continue these conversations. We've got another one of these scheduled on, I think, July 8th that you can join us for and we'll, we'll continue the conversation. But two pretty practical questions that came from our audience. First mm -hmm. one is around diversity training, diversity programming. And, and as it's implemented on campus. And this person says, I usually see more students, faculty and staff of color at these types of events and this type of training, but mm -hmm. not as many white students, faculty and staff. How can we encourage our white colleagues to attend these much needed programs and opportunities? So what advice would you give for that? I think it just depends uh, on the department. Departments. I know in our department, it, it's usually on a voluntary basis, uh, but maybe departments can offer incentives for uh, faculty and staff to attend those trainings, um, just to encourage them to actually attend. Um, but I, I agree, sometimes when you go to trainings, you will see more people of color in diversity training. So I, I do think that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And to add to that, um, you cannot love what you do not know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there are, um, there are so many things when we, when, when we come into these things, there are so many things that we don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I, I had the opportunity to teach Christian heritage last semester and, um, kind of the last half of my, the last third of my class, when, when we focused on American Christianity, I focused particularly on race and I told the history of lynching and all of those kinds of things. And there were so many of my students who reached out and said, I had no idea that any of that had happened. Oh my goodness, that gives me, that gives me you know, new context. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact of the matter is, is that if we're to love, like I said, if, if the goal is to love our brothers and sisters, um, we've got to know, we've got to know them. And we've got to know, we've got to know their histories. We've got to know, like I said, the differences between kind of how we, how we navigate the world and stuff like that. And so, you know, my, mm -hmm. My, my, my appeal is, hey, we're do, you're, you're doing this not just as a hoop to jump through, but as, but as a way to love, as a way to love your brothers and sisters and neighbors well. Mm -hmm. Because when you know more about, when you know more about their experiences, the way, like I said, the way they, way people have to navigate the world differently and things like that, it can build the empathy that, that's then necessary for us to see the kind of, the kind, the kind of change that we would, that we would like to see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I think I would just second that because it feels like there's got to be a consciousness around this. And it, it's not just hoops through which we jump, but relational. Um, there, there has got to be this recognition and, you know, as Baylor, I hope becomes more and more diverse, that um, mm -hmm. we become more involved in the lives of people who are not exactly like ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. I, I live in a gated community. I mean, literally and figuratively, and, and many Americans do. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to live in a literal gated community to live in a gated community where you're surrounded mostly by people like yourselves. And, and I think one of the most important things we can do is to reach out to people who don't share uh, our, our color or our particular religious or political affiliation. Or uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the biggest things that we can do is just simply say, I wanna be conscious about reaching across the divides in our culture, which have become mm -hmm. so entrenched, um, because we are called to this ministry of reconciliation in Second Corinthians, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that has got to be central to that is our ability to talk to each other and to love each other and to see each other. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm I'm a big believer in sitting across the table from somebody at lunch, and um, I, I think that literally or figuratively, that is that has got to be a big part of next steps for us. Yeah. It's true. Building relationships and getting to know people is so important in this whole process. Absolutely. So I appreciate those perspectives. The last question is probably one I'm going to have to take, uh, but I'm happy for you all the way in. It says, um, if we do ever experience racial injustice on campus by either a coworker or a Baylor member or a fellow student, is there an office or can we, who can we call to speak with? Will discipline be placed? or what are the plans for this type of scenario? We have many ways uh, in which you can report uh, any type of uh, racially biased or harassing behavior. Our equity office, you can go online, there's a phone number. 
uh, that you can reach out and the equity office will reach out to you to, to hear what happened and to investigate. We have a, a, a mechanism called Report It on campus where students and others can report issues that might occur. Uh, there's also a, a confidential uh, ethics point um, uh, mechanism by which folks even outside of Baylor can submit uh, issues if they hear or see something. And then certainly, I, I believe, particularly students, if you, you feel like you've been treated inappropriately, there have been racial comments or some kind of harassment, you know, talk to one of your faculty members, talk to a staff member. They know how to get you to the right resources as well. We want everybody to feel safe and cared for on our campus. Uh, we do investigate all of those claims. We do discipline people appropriately, whether they're faculty, staff, or students, if they're found responsible for inappropriate behavior that violates our policies. You can also find all of our policies online, our civil rights policy and others uh, that will help you understand that process as well. So really encourage you to take advantage of that. We need to know about those incidences so we can address them appropriately and ensure uh, that all of our students are safe and cared for on our campus. Well, thank you so much uh, to the panelists today. You all were wonderful colleagues in this conversation, Dr. Moody Ramirez, uh, Mr. Foley, Dr. Garrett. Um, I think today was a really important step for us at Baylor in, in addressing issues of race and, and social injustice. And certainly my pledge as president is that this will be the first of many conversations. As I said, we have another one coming up uh, soon on July 8th. And one of many tangible actions we intend to take as a university. So as we leave today, uh, let us pray to take the instruction found in Micah 6-8 to heart, uh, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. So thank you so much. God bless each and every one of you. Appreciate you being with us today.